Most of you probably have heard T.D. Jake speak sometime. I enjoy him a lot. And I would think he's always been good, but he hasn't. He's had some tough times. When he got started, one of the first times he ever spoke, he approached the microphone. He's a great big tall guy. The mic was down too low, so he just took it off the stand and held it. He didn't realize how much his hands were shaking. It looked more like a tambourine in his hand than a microphone, and it shook through his whole message. He was just terrified, but he thought, I can deal with this. I can fix this. I can help this. Next time he spoke, he made sure that they had the microphone on a tall stand. He approached, he put his hands behind his back, and for the first 10 minutes, they were shaking, even though he was squeezing them as tight as he could. And he got going and the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was able to free his hands, pick the mic up and hold it without shaking. it. He started his first church or he was called his first church. He was living in one place and this was in another city. It was in West Virginia. And he had about 10 members there. It was in a little storefront. He said it was so small that people would come to hear, and he'd be standing looking through the plate glass windows in the storefront and watch people looking all over for this big, huge church they were looking for and drive right past him and never find him. It was that small, but he kept preaching faith. It didn't matter if the microphone was shaking, he was preaching faith. And then he had some times where he was a pastor for two years before he got married. That's kind of unusual. A lot of pastors in his denomination were married, but he wasn't. And he was pastoring, and he met the love of his life, and he proposed. And about the time he said, I do, things shifted in our economy. He was doing great. He had a full-time job with Union Carbide. He was practicing. Uh, he was preaching part-time in this little church, so he had plenty of money. But then he lost his job, and he went on unemployment, and the unemployment ran out. And then his car got repossessed. And he's now got a family. He's got a wife. He's got to take care of her. He has no money. He has no job. This tiny little church. After they took his car, the deacons got together and got him a car to drive. It's a 1967 Valiant that was pretty much rusted out. The back floorboard had just rusted out so much he had to put carpet in the back so his children wouldn't drop toys through the floorboard. It was a fat old car. The deacons had him park it behind the church because they didn't want anybody to know his, their pastor was driving such a ragged car. But even through this time, he still preached faith. He kept talking about faith. And then they ran out of money. They ran out of food. He said the only way they could eat was to take apples off a tree. And they lived that way for a little while. And he still came in preaching faith. We're going to talk about faith again this whole semester, this fall. We're in faith. And Monday, I didn't know where we were going. We finished up on having faith for your identity, faith for the identity of others that God has created, and faith for God's identity. you got to have faith for those things. And I thought, where are we going next, God? Monday, I had this idea about faith for aging. And we got some young ones in this crowd. We got some not so young. I think I'm probably still the oldest guy in the room. At 7.30 this morning, I was not the oldest guy. We got some 80-year-olds in that. That's the group that's been going for 24 years. And we were a lot younger 24 years ago. But I was asking God about this. Do you really want me to talk about faith for aging? He said, well, you need it. Maybe somebody else there will too. And I thought, okay. And to confirm it, Tuesday night, I was just kind of weary, and I thought, I'm just going to watch something and go brain dead. So I open up YouTube, and I find the second season of Linus has come out. That's about some pretty tough special ops ladies, and they're bad to the bone. And in the opening scene, this is how God spoke to me and confirmed. I meant it when I said, faith for old aging. There was a new soldier that I did not remember from last season, special ops. He was an older guy, much older than the rest of the team. And they were about to go into battle. And this lioness type of lady was talking to him. And this is what he said. Well, you know what they say. Beware the old 
soldier, and you hear his gun click. He's old for a reason. So there is a lot of wisdom. We're going to look at three things that I think will help you age gracefully and help you go as long as God wants to leave you on this planet. The first thing we're going to talk about is continue to believe the Bible. You know, when we get older, sometimes we start thinking, well, that's for the young ones. Scripture is for people of all ages at all times. Keep believing what the Bible says. The second thing we're going to look at is walk by faith and not sight, especially when we look in the, the mirror. Walk by faith, not by sight. Keep going that way. And the third thing we're going to look at is humble yourself because that will activate the grace of God for you. So I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16. This is motivation of why we should keep reading the Bible and remembering the Bible and believing the Bible. 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you're struggling with something now, you can't get it right, read the Bible because it will equip you for Every good work, every good work in every profession, there's something in this for you. I, I realized years ago, as I continue to study scripture, but I like to read business books. I like to read stuff outside of the Christian realm just to have a different perspective. And typically the world is about 20 years ahead of the church. And I had a prophet explain to me one time that's because God uses the world to keep pushing the church along. So I looked outside of Scripture for a lot of new things, but I realized every new thing that was coming out that was working, everything, I could show you its foundation in Scripture. The latest on management, the latest on leadership, quantum physics, medicine. There is so much hidden in Scripture that we're still uncovering. I love how science continues to validate Scripture. You know, after a lot of time goes by, we start seeing things. It's like, oh, my gosh, how did God know about that three or four thousand years ago? Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, penetrating to dividing bone and marrow soul and spirit, excuse me, soul and spirit, bone and marrow. Well, there's so many people alive today because of bone marrow transplants. They didn't know about that 2,000 years ago when somebody was inspired to write that in Scripture. So there's a lot of truth there. We used to wonder about the Psalms. A man, as a man thinketh in his heart, because we got so smart back in the early 1900s that we know people don't think with their hearts, they think with their brains. And we're all about the brain. All of our thinking is in the brain. Well, just in my lifetime, they've discovered we've got a bunch of neuropeptides, some amino acids that are floating around in our body that carry emotional memory, and they're huge concentrations in the brain, in the gut, and in the heart. And we literally do think with our hearts. That was said three or 4,000 years ago. It took us that long to discover the truth of Scripture. This morning when I got up early in the morning, the alarm went off, and about three or four minutes after the alarm went off, I heard something on my rooftop. It was rain. Do you remember rain? We had rain last night. It was so, so nice. And it reminded me of Isaiah 55, which is so important. And this is so useful if you will use it. It says, just as sure as the rain and the snow come down from the heavens, watering the earth, causing it to bud and flourish, providing bread for the eater and seed for the sower. So it is with my word that comes out of my 
mouth. It will not return to me void. It will not return to me without accomplishing its purposes. Now, think through this with me. You were purchased for a price. It cost Jesus his life for you to have this relationship with God. You're the property of God. God owns you as he owns everything. Therefore, your mouth is God's property. It's God's mouth. And when God's word comes out of God's mouth, it accomplishes his purposes. That's guaranteed in black and white. That's something to think about. So how do you use this? Well, it comes in real, real handy because most of us are probably too hard on ourselves. And we say nasty things to ourselves, like how could I be such an idiot? How could I be such a stupid idiot? Well, that's not what God says about you. You ever thought about that? He says you have the mind of Christ. He said you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. He said if you'll ask me for wisdom, I'll give it to you generously. So once you make little mistakes like that and say bad things or think bad things or feel bad things about yourself, undo it with the word of God. One of the Old Testament minor prophets said, let the weak say, I am strong. Well, don't the Ten Commandments tell us not to lie? It's not a lie. It's a statement of faith. And see, we're studying faith. So we need to make these statements of faith. There is power in speaking to situations. You can speak to situations. I've, I've known of people. I remember Jesse Duplantis when he just, he'd been a hardcore rock and roller, lots of drugs, lots of alcohol, gave his life to Jesus, felt called to ministry. And he was sitting there with absolutely nothing to do. Wasn't part of any Christian organization. He just wanted to serve God. And he sat in his kitchen. He looked at the phone on the wall and he said, phone ring. And the phone ring and somebody was calling him for the first time to ask him if he comes speak in their church. So things like that happen. I remember Moore Sheets, who was the pastor of Hillcrest Church. It's not there anymore. It's the gateway building on Hillcrest. But when Moore Sheets had started that church, he was going to build it by faith. And they had enough money, they bought the steel. The steel had been delivered, but they were out of money. And he stood there looking at the steel, and he spoke to it. And he said, rise up, O steel. Sounds biblical, doesn't it? And the steel, shortly thereafter, the money came in, and they built the structure, and they built the church. It's been standing for decades now. So you can speak to situations, you can speak to yourself, and you need to come into agreement with God. You need to have faith to keep believing his word. When you say it, things happen. Dr. Paul Ch Tall Youngi Cho was pastor of the largest church on the planet in Seoul, Korea. He had about 750,000 active members. And when I say active members, they were all all those members were in home groups. They were coming to worship services. They had worship services all weekend long. They had prayer mountain. They bought a mountain. It had a thousand caves in it. Some of them they had carved out. And they kept it staffed 24-7 with a thousand people all the time, 365 days a year, praying for the church and praying for prayer requests. They'd take a time slot. They would go to their cave. They'd have a list of things to pray for, and they did it. They were active members. He was a brilliant man, and he knew how to trust God. He was having a, a real problem early in his life with faith. He was walking everywhere. He didn't have a car, and his church was growing. He had to get around to see all the people, especially when they were sick, when they were in the hospital. He said, God, I need a bicycle. And he prayed for a bicycle for a long time. And he didn't get a bicycle. He said, God, what's the deal? I need a bicycle. Why won't you give me a bicycle? And God said, you didn't tell me what color you want. I want a red bicycle. I want to give me a red bicycle. And very shortly thereafter, somebody gave him a red bicycle. Sometimes we ask for God for things that are just nebulous. Sometimes we need to stay general. Sometimes we get to more specific. 
about those things. But he wondered, why does the Bible say so much about what we say, about the power of the tongue? And he pulled together his doctors and his scientists and anybody that might know something about the body or about speech. And he said, I need you guys to help me. Why does the Bible talk about it? And he quoted a lot of scriptures. In the tongue is power of life and death. The tongue is like the bridle on a horse. It's like the rudder of the ship. He said, what does this mean to you guys? And they said, oh, oh, the speech center of the brain is a predominant center. And when we say something, it's connected to our entire central nervous system. So when we speak, that message goes to every part of your body. Your whole body gets the message. If you say, I'm stupid, it's like, well, I guess we're stupid cells. Uh, if I have the mind of Christ, wow, I've got the mind of Christ. Whatever you say goes through your whole system. So it's very powerful. Suzanne Wallace, who's the wife of Dr. John Wallace, who was my pastor and still a mentor to this day, he's 77 now. But I was in a meeting with him, and he asked his wife to share something. And she said, you know, the other day I realized most people trust their own voice more than they trust any other voice on the planet. When it really comes down to it, we do tend to trust ourselves. And she said, we should talk to ourselves. David in Psalm 103, and I would consider David an exceedingly, successful person. He talked to himself a lot. Listen to him talking to himself in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all of his benefits. It's good for you to say things like this. He heals all of my illnesses. He forgives all my sin. He redeems my life from the pit. He showers me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things. He restores my youth like the eagles. So take the scripture, the divine truth from God, apply it to yourself, speak it. Because when you speak it, it's going to go through your whole system and you begin to get it. That's what it means. It's like the bridle in a horse's mouth. It's like a ship and the rudder. It controls where you go. If the scripture were meant today, it might be it's like a mouse and a keyboard. That kind of controls where everything goes in our lives these days. So you can control your life just by, if you've got a problem, address the problem. Speak God's truth. I've always told myself I can't do that. God says I can. I can do that. I don't have enough. The Bible says I do have enough. My God's going to supply all of my needs through his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Jesus said ask. So I'm asking. I'm seeking. I'm knocking. And anything I ask for, it's going to come. What I'm seeking, I'll find. What I'm knocking, the door will be open because that's what God says. So it's so important to keep believing Scripture. Had a friend years ago. He was a man of faith. First time I met him, his name was Bill Crum. We had friends at Prestonwood, which was the biggest, fastest growing Baptist church in town when I was at Lake Point, and they kind of put their arms around us and helped us. We were a bunch of young guys, a bunch of young cowboys. We're just doing the best we can to build a church. We got about 300 people. They got probably six, 9,000 at the time. They were just really, really growing fast. And they helped us. And our pastor got a call one day and said, hey, one of our best members left here, moved to East Texas because he retired and he just wanted to fish. He fished for about two or three months, hated it, was driving his wife crazy, so he moved back to Rockwall, got a house on the lake there. And that's close to your church. You ought, to, you ought to go after him. He'd be a great church member. Well, I'd heard about him. He was on my list of people to get in touch with. One day I pulled up in the parking lot of the church, 
this guy was coming out the front doors of the church, obviously been in the office for something, meeting with somebody, uh, empty-handed, so I knew he wasn't a salesman. And he was tall, he was lean, he was tan, had white hair. And uh, I said hello, and he said hello back. And somehow we got a little conversation. I introduced myself, and he said, I'm Bill Crum. I said, from Preston Wood, I've heard about you. We heard you're moving. Welcome to the neighborhood. We got in a conversation. I said, before you retired, what did you do? What was your career? He said, well, I was, I was a banana salesman. I thought, okay, this guy looks like he's living outdoors. He's really tan. He's lean. He's quiet. He's laid back. I just pictured him in his truck backing up to the Dallas Farmer's Market and selling bananas out of the back. I didn't know he'd been the vice president of marketing for Dole. He would ship plane loads filled with bananas all over the world from all their banana fields in Hawaii. Big deal. Great Bible scholar. He started every day, every day. When I got to know him, they had a house in the shores. It was in the neighborhood I was living in. He was in the bigger houses. And uh, every day, it was his habit. He would get up, go out the garage, drive to the 7-Eleven that was two miles up the road, get himself a cup of coffee, come back in the house, go straight to his office. And he only worked in the office. But before that, he was a man of habit. Before he got up to go get his coffee in the morning, he would read his Bible in the living room. That was where he spent time with God. And he read, it, read his Bible every day. Fabulous teacher. We gave him a Sunday school class. It broke up in six months because they wouldn't fit in the room. Those six months, he raised up a new teacher to take half the class, let the new teacher pick whoever he wanted. He took whoever was left over, built it up again in about six months. Tremendous ministry became an elder there, but he was a man of God. He believed the word of God. Now, here's this guy. He's just retired. He's set for life, but he's bored. He's got to do something. So what kind of part-time job would you think a guy like that would get? He becomes a consultant for the country of Guatemala, helps them with all their produce. He goes to work for a little company named Maui Pineapple that was just getting started, and they were tiny. They weren't even a blip on the screen of the big companies. He'd worked for Dole. He competed with Del Monte. But when Maui came along and they hired him, he thought this is going to be fun. He took about a third of the market from Dole and Del Monte. They came to him and offered him huge sums of money to stop working. Last time I talked to him, he was doing great. He was in his late 80s, and I was trying to track him down again just two or three, four years ago. And I, I was able to find his son, Jackson, on the Internet. His son's a minister, was on staff at Willow Creek, doing great. And I talked to Jackson and said, hey, is your dad still living? He said, man, I remember you. He talked about you. He said y'all were good friends, and he always loved having his younger friends. I used to be young, believe it or not, and I was one of his younger friends. But he died in his late 90s and had lived a very good life. Let me read you some scriptures about the aging process and what God has in store for you as you get older. Psalm 90.10, our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Psalm 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalm 92, 12 through 15, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Proverbs 30, 16, 31. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It's gained. 
in a righteous life. Proverbs 20, 29. The glory of young men is their strength. The gray hair, the splendor of the old. In Ecclesiastes 3, 11 through 13. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know there is nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. A lot of promises. So we need to keep believing God. In addition to needing to keep believing God, we also need to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is our verse for that, but let me give you context. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through, 7, through 8. So we are always of good courage. That's what Paul says. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. Now, that word good courage, that can mean good courage. That can mean good confidence, good boldness, good cheer. So you've got that mentioned twice. And right between you are of good courage and good courage, good confidence, boldness, good cheer. Right in the middle of that is we walk by faith and not by sight. Nothing wrong with your senses, but that word for walk is peripateo, and it's accurately translated to walk or to live. So if we live by faith rather than sight, it's going to be much better. Because when we're living by faith, faith is being sure of things hoped for, certain of things not seen. We drop down to Hebrews eleven six. It says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. For everyone who earnestly seek him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So when you're living by faith, you're living by those good things that God wants to do. And you're looking at those in the spirit realm, in your imagination. It's hard to figure out exactly how to do this, but that's why God gave us an imagination that's so powerful. We can see these things that are unseen. We see them before they come. I look around this church, everything in this room started as a thought. Somebody thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have benches with a back? Once upon a time, churches had benches that didn't have a back you could lean back on. Somebody thought, you know, I'd be more comfortable if these benches had a back, and they did that. People thought about everything you're looking at. Even you, mom and dad, there was a sparkle in their eye. That's where you came from. Somebody thought about these stained glass windows. And a theme, a man in this church actually made all these stained glass windows. They were all donated specifically. And it's just everything that exists started with a thought. So we can walk by faith and we can think about the things that we like. See, we're told how to think. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. That's going to put you on the path of faith, thinking about the good stuff God can do, God wants to do, God has promised to do, rather than walking by sight, where you're looking at the coming election. And you're looking at what may or may not happen with either party. And you're wondering what's going on in the Ukraine. And you're looking at all the perversion and all the crime and all the corruption throughout everything. That will bring you down. That's why God says, look at me. 
in Hebrews, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's trying to tell us in so many ways, look at me. Don't look at all those problems. Don't look at what you don't have. Look at me. Look at what you do have. Lift up your heads. Lift up your faces. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your countenance. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Nope. I got to look at this. We go where we look. Do you want to go to trouble or do you want to go to God? Look at the right stuff. So we walk by faith and not by sight. Next thing we need to do is humble ourselves. In the book of James, chapter 4, read you this passage. Chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You gotta stop here for a minute. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is really important. Man's humility activates the grace of God. Man's humility activates the grace of God. God opposes the proud. That word oppose is a Hebrew word, comes from a Hebrew word. It's a picture in the Hebrew language because this passage shows up three times in Scripture. In the Old Testament, it's a word picture, the Hebrew characters, of somebody coming dressed in full battle armament. So if you want to pick a fight with God, Pride will do it every time. I've gone toe-to-toe with him way too many times. Haven't won yet. Never will. He wins. So it's like, Satan, excuse me. Let me deal with this one. He's proud. He's mine. He opposes us. He's going to win every time. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This morning in the middle of a lesson, I just sensed the Lord said, talk to people about, ask them, do they, do you guys know when to resist the devil? And so many times he masquerades as an angel of light. So many times he sounds just exactly like me. He sounds like my thoughts. He sounds like my feelings. And I don't realize that. I just think I'm just, I'm just having a bad day. I'm just not, things are not good. So resist the devil when you get out of your love and your joy and your peace. That's a good time to resist him. When you start getting negative about things, when you start feeling weak, when you feel like you're not going to make it, when you're just so down, you know, that's when you need to resist the devil. The best way to resist the devil is draw near to God. Turn your back on the devil Move toward God. The closer you get to God, the farther away he wants to be from you. So when you're thinking bad thoughts, when you're having bad feelings, that's a real good time to resist the devil and humble yourself in that. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will do it. You don't have to exalt yourselves. You don't have to pick yourself up. He will do it if you humble yourself. So to do that, we got to know what is humility. I would define humility as seeing yourself the way God sees you. Moses was described as the meekest man in all the land, the meekest, most humble man. How did he get that way? Lots of bad mistakes. He started out with a calling from God to set his people free, but he got tired of waiting on God, so he killed the Egyptian. That was the first step, kill one of them, because they oppressed my people. These people had been in slavery and bondage and captivity for 400 years. He wanted them out of it. That was something God put in him, but he got ahead of God. So he killed the Egyptian. He has to go into hiding for the next 40 years. And finally, when God shows up in the burning bush, he's got questions. One of his questions is, who are you? 
Well, I am that. I am. It's really interesting. Wayne Dyer pointed this out before he was anywhere close to Christian. He did something with that. I always grew up in a church that said, God said, I am that I am. You can punctuate it different. I'm that. I'm that. I'm that. I am. But he was identifying himself in the easiest way for Moses to understand of just I am. I'm the ultimate source of all being. And Moses had other questions. Who am I? A stutter. I'm a murderer. I'm a fugitive of the law. What would you want with me? And he saw himself the way God saw him. He saw all of his faults. He was not arrogant. He was not cocky. He immediately put that out front. God, I, I'm not even a good speaker. I stutter pretty badly. I'm a bad communicator. Take Aaron with you. He's a good speaker. Didn't slow God down. But I'm, I'm wanted by the law. I could walk into the Pharaoh's house. And back in those days, if Pharaoh didn't like you or recognizes you, and you killed an Egyptian, and he was a Hebrew, and you killed one of our people, off with his head, a sword would swing, and a head would fall across the room. It happened like that. It was brutal. So he took huge risks. And even though he thought, man, I've been out of the game for the last 40 years. Me? Lead anybody at 80 years old? But when God said, you're the man I want to do it, he said, okay. He recognized his strengths. He recognized his weaknesses. He saw himself the way God sees him. My best guess, and I, I put some money on the table on this one, most of us in this room are going to fall off this tightrope of humility on the side of putting ourselves down. We were nearly trained to do that. We were nearly trained that humility is putting yourself down. It's thinking less of yourself. Now, my definition is humility is seeing yourself the way God sees you. Most of us, I would say, we underestimate ourselves more than we overestimate ourselves. You can fall off this tightrope on either side. and It's a hard fall, whichever side you take. But if you stay balanced, Seeing yourself the way God sees you. What does that mean in day-to-day -day life? You don't think you're better than other people. You know, God created everybody. God loves everybody the same. And sometimes we think God loves me and he hates all those people I hate. He doesn't. He loves them. He values them just as much as you. And when you realize that just because somebody is homeless and is asking you if you got any spare change, doesn't mean that you're worth more than them to God, in God's eyes. It's a hard lesson to learn. You might ask God, who am I? We covered three weeks of identity, but it's always a good question. God, if you walked into a crowd and you were going to call me out with words that distinguish me from everybody else in this huge crowd, what words would you use? See, he created you. You have a unique identity created by God. And if you recognize that, it's amazing the things you can overcome. Because when you humble yourself, see yourself the way God sees you, that's when he gives you grace. That is your benefit at God's expense. That's a free pass. That's something you didn't work for. It's something that's given to you as a gift, and you activate all of the free gifts by simply humbling yourselves. It really works well. Let's look at some examples in Scripture. In Exodus chapter 17, we find Moses, and Moses was getting old, and Moses was tired. And Moses couldn't do the things he'd done before. He was always a very, very, very strong person. But he's getting up in the years now, and he can't do what he used to, and they're in the middle of a battle. Read you a few verses of what was going on in this battle. Exodus chapter 17, verse 11. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek, prevail. But Moses' hands grew weary 
So he took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Now Moses was willing to receive help. He was willing to. You know, if I'm trying to hold my hand up and get tired and I keep it up and every time my hand drops, people on my side die. They get killed in battle. Somebody may come up and grab a hand and try to hold it up. It's a good, good chance I might want to say, get your hands off of me. I hold my own hands up. Moses had the humility to realize he couldn't do it by himself. And he let these two guys be right there with him, holding his hands up, and that's what gave them the victory. we got to learn to do that. Years ago, when I was a youth minister, I'd spoken with a group of other youth ministers in South Texas. It was a Southern Baptist Convention, or a Texas Baptist Convention deal. We'd been down there for a couple of days, and there was a guy down there, very wealthy, and he heard we were in town, and he had connections with the Baptist General Convention in Texas, and he said, hey, let me let me let me meet your conference speakers. Send them over for dinner. This guy's name was Walter Haley. So somebody borrowed the church van and we loaded up. And there's not many things more fun than a van loaded with six or seven youth ministers. Youth ministers know if you ever want to have fun in a church, get the youth ministry. That's where the fun is most of the time. You'll find some of the most fun people in the church there. So all these youth ministers are together. We're in the van. We go to Walter Haley's house. Beautiful meal. His dining room overlooked the Blanco River. It was up on top of this hill. Big valley down there. Fabulous sunset. Incredible time. When it was over, we'd had dessert. He stepped up, and he was a little short guy. He was old, and he kind of twitched when he talked, and he stuttered a little bit. And he said, I'd like to tell you all about some, something I learned when I was about your age that really made a big difference, I think, about helpful to you. He said, I started out selling insurance to grocery store employees. So I'd go to the grocery store. I'd go to the back room, to the stock room. There's usually a telephone on the wall, and I'd just meet people give them my business card and to, to, to tell them that I'm selling insurance and would love to talk with them when they're on their break, if they have time, if they have any interest. And I'd talk to people. And if somebody bought one of my policies, I would ask them, would you be willing to call five of your friends at the other grocery stores in this chain and just tell them that you thought my product was good enough for you and your family and ask them if I could just come talk to them. You can, you can assure them I won't put any pressure on them. And I mean, he stuttered and he twitched and he sold insurance. Well, he retired with about $90 million in his back pocket and about another $120 million in stocks in various insurance companies he'd been involved with. He said, to, to gentlemen, the, the, the thing I wanted to tell you today is that people will love you more if you let them help you than if you help them. I had to think about that for a long time. I think it's true. I'm reluctant to let people help me. It's dumb. Because humility says, hey, if I can't do something by myself, I welcome any help I can get. Don't you know that Aaron and her came to love Moses more than ever because they got to be part of this battle. They got to control the victory. They got to hold his arms. He let them help him. We need to learn to humble ourselves and let other people help us as we get older and older. I'm going to wrap it up this with this for today. T.D. Jake started out slowly and small. And suddenly, he got really, really popular all over the world. And he'd gone to Washington, D.C., to Evangel Temple, which was a huge, big church. When he got there, he was 
speaking. He'd done two or three days there. And while he was there, the Washington Post released a blistering article about him. This was 30 years ago or so. Horrible article. Crushed him. He was still young. He had not really learned what it was like to be so well known in such a big shot. He didn't know to take it as a compliment that the Washington Post would put something on the front page of the newspaper about him. All he could think about, they said horrible things and millions of people think I'm a terrible person and they misrepresented him. He thought, I'm done with this. I just can't take the pressure. I'm going to quit. This is going to be my last sermon. So he preached what he was thinking was his last sermon, and he gave it everything he had. He was exhausted. If you've ever seen him, he usually wears lots of clothes, beautiful suits, often three-piece suits. He's got a vest. He's got a top coat. He's got, he dresses up. He really does. And he sweats like he is working out in the gym. He's usually dripping wet. He often walks with a towel to wipe it off of himself, but he gives it everything he's got. He was done. He's going to quit. He's going to go up to the room. And the people who were there hosting him said, there's some lady that said it's real important that she talk to you. She really needs to talk to you. He was tired. He didn't want to talk to anybody else. He'd given all he had to give. He said, well, we'll tell her when I come down, if she's still here, I'll talk to her. And he went upstairs. He, he knew it's going to be a long time before I come down from my room. But he rested, took a nap, and he went down. Hours later, and when the elevators opened, this lady was sitting in front of the elevators watching. And when he started to step up, she got up, and she toddled up. She was tiny. She was frail. She was frantic. And she said, Bishop Jace, I've got to talk to you. I've just checked myself out of the hospital a few hours ago. I had a dead baby in my body, and it was starting to rot. I've never been so sick in all of my life. And I went to the hospital. They took it out. They didn't discharge me. I just left because God came, told me to come tell you something. I would not be alive today if it were not for your preaching. Now, this guy has just been crushed by the Washington Post. She says, you have kept me alive, and we need you. God has called you to us, not to them, and we need you. And he said when she said that, it was like a bullet hit him in the chest. He got choked up. He thanked the lady. He got to his car as soon as he could. He drove home crying all the way. He said that lady reminded him of why he breathes, why he exists. He was about to walk away from it all. But God raised her up out of a hospital bed, had her come in her weakened condition and say, you saved my life and we need you. We need you to keep preaching. And it's for us. It's not for them. Don't do it for them. Do it for us. We're the ones who need you. And it just gave him what he needed to keep on keeping on. Decades later, he was at a book signing, and a lady walked up to the table and said, do you remember Evangel Temple in Washington, D.C.? And he looked at her, and he just burst into tears. He said, I've been praying that I would meet you someday because you saved my ministry, maybe even my whole life. I was, I, I just couldn't handle the pressure in those days. I was, that was going to be my last sermon because I didn't yet understand that every time there's a promotion, there's a new problem. Every time there's a new level, there's a new devil. Every time he said, your reward for conquering your current difficulty, your current challenge is going to be your next challenge. He said, I didn't know that yet. I didn't know to be grateful that they thought I was a big enough deal to write an article about me. I just didn't know that. And I was done. And you kept me going. And he was able to finally meet her, prayed for years that God would give him a chance to say, thank you. We need faith as we get older. And for the rest of your life, it's going to keep you going to believe the word of God. It's going to keep you going. 
to do these things, it's going to make all the difference to humble yourselves, to believe the word of God, to think the way God tells you to do. If you do it, it will keep you going and you'll be useful 